Most of the damage was confined to signs, power lines, and an occasional tree or two. There was a spectacular explosion and fireball when power lines were shorted on a pole near National Linen Service on West Fairview Avenue. City firemen and electrical crews were on the scene in minutes. They cut the power and put out a smoldering utility pole. From there east, most anything that was not anchored but was flat against the wind blew over. This restaurant sign literally had the L blown out of it. And this newly remodeled restaurant will have to get another new sign. Most of the old ones in the parking lot or in the middle of the street. Service station attendant Jim Brown was outside when the winds came. We're standing by the pumps out there pumping gas, and the wind blew up. It took about 30 seconds. It just blew in, and it was over. What did you see? Dark clouds, a lot of rain, wind, blowing signs down around. And like a lot of other people, Jim and his boss were busy cleaning up after the winds and rain subsided. I'm Bob Howell, WSFA TV News on Fairview Avenue. The model traffic record system was financed with a federal grant through the Office of Highway and Traffic Safety. It's designed to keep records on drivers, tickets, accidents, and all of the information that affects them. By using the system, law enforcement officials can identify drivers who've been ticketed and fail to appear in court. Through the use of the MTRS, an unsettled ticket can prevent renewal of the individual's driver's license. During the first quarter of 1983, using the system, there were 14,089 revocations for failure to appear in court, compared to 6,746 during the same quarter last year without the system. But the MTRS is not only designed to assist police officers. We thought for a long time that we need to give people fair notice that the department's the department has noticed their driving record and they're showing some irresponsible behavior so now for the first time in many years we're giving an advance warning when a person's point level reaches eight points advising them that if their driving habits don't change for the better then they will be getting a suspension notice from us major hammond says the purpose of the system is not to see how many licenses they can suspend but rather to let drivers know that they need to be more careful and attentive to traffic laws mac carmack wsfa tv news A great deal of America's housing stock, the older stock, really would serve as well as housing today and we're all too frequent to abandon that and move on to new construction, frequently finding that, that new construction doesn't have much quality or character and we're simply saying that where those structures are sound and architecturally significant, uh, give those at least equal footing and, and decisions, you know, political decisions in trying to preserve them. I have red resumes on my red letters of recommendation that I write to the council on. I know it's on y'all's decision. And that, yes, in fact, the review board that some. Stokes. Enhancement of their neighborhood. All factors. Get out of the neighborhood petitions and have seen a lot of the neighbors in that area. Under those conditions, we have over 75% of the homeowners agree. So that's time, I think that should have been done too. It should have been incumbent upon those who are opposing this to make sure that they, in fact, $99 is all it takes to get out of Montgomery for a while, but there's a catch. You have to buy your tickets from Continental by May 15th and begin your trip by June 15th. And it's only good for 76 cities within the Continental United States, and the $99 is only one way. However, the Continental promotion has gotten the attention of the other carriers in this city. $99 is a good deal, a cheap way to go across country. So far, none of the other carriers in town are trying to match the fares, although Republic Airlines will honor a ticket bought from Continental or any other carrier. Delta's marketing manager, Ken Creel, says Delta is taking a cautious approach to the Continental fare, but he says Delta can't afford to match the rates city for city, although they are offering lower rates to some cities in the West. He says it's hard to predict how much the $99 tickets will hurt Delta's ticket sales now, but he says he's sure it will have some kind of an impact.
Continental is Montgomery's newest air carrier, and these low fares are part of a promotional attempt to attract passengers, sort of a grand opening sale. Airport Services Supervisor Robert White says so far there hasn't been a mad rush to buy tickets, and Continental probably won't feel the impact for at least a couple of days. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. 19-year-old Michael Joe Hubbard testified today that he witnessed Bell rob and shoot Mims on December 14, 1981. Hubbard says he and Bell planned on selling Mims some stolen goods. He says they waited for Mims at a Clanton laundry and told Mims to follow them to the Church of God campground. Hubbard says when they got to the campground, Bell pulled a gun and stuck it in Mims' face. The 19-year-old man who's under police protection says Bell told him to tie Mims up. Hubbard says Bell then took Mims' wallet and shoved him into the trunk of his car. Hubbard testified they drove to this wooded area in Chilton County, where Bell got Mims out of the trunk, took him to a small trench, and shot him twice in the head. Hubbard told police what he knew about the case three months later. Chilton County Sheriff James Johnson says since that time, Hubbard has been working with lawmen trying to locate Mims' body. Hubbard testified that Bell would not say where he hid the body. He says Bell told him that he used some type of acid to destroy any trace of Mims' remains. Bell says he's innocent of the charges. Under cross-examination by defense attorney Paul Harden, Hubbard told the jury he's been selling stolen goods to Mims for some five years. Following Hubbard's testimony, Joe Austin Jr. took the stand and told the jury that Bell came over to his house the night of the 14th. He says he had a conversation with Bell that night, and during the conversation, Bell told him that he met Mims to sell some hot merchandise, but it later turned into a robbery. It could be sometime tomorrow before the state winds up its case. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News, Clanton. Tonight's program at the King Memorial Baptist Church brought together some of the men and women who made the Montgomery bus boycott work. And I watched it from its inception there. The Montgomery advertiser inadvertently further advertised it by somebody giving them the news and they printed it in the Sunday morning paper and it spread like wildfire. They didn't know what they were doing. One of the speakers tonight described the bus boycott as an idea whose time had come. It merely needed a town, Montgomery, a leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, described here by organizer Georgia Gilmore. And he would always tell you, never to think that you were down, that you were always somebody. Because when Jesus made you, he made and gave everybody breath and there were nobody better than the other. And it needed someone whose feet were tired. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. The firing system for the sound suppression water system on. We have main engine ignition, and we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America. Because everybody have asked me and asked and my predecessors, well, what's it like? Describe it. Well, it's difficult to describe it. And I've often said, well, we ought to fly a, a, a poet or an artist or someone that could capture the beauty of flying in space and then bring it back and be able to express it to people. Maybe we ought to fly journalists and let them write it down instead of questioning people like me that can come down firsthand, you know. In cooperation with the Montgomery Ministerial Association, WSFA-TV presents The Pastor's Study. Each morning with for more than 20 Dr. years, Felix area e. James pastors have been delivering an abbreviated Baptist sermon Church. via TV 12. Preaching the word through the airways is not a new There's concept. There's a story in the like Bible the in the Old Testament. The idea is spreading. Now, many churches want to record the message and play it back to its congregation. Baptist Telnet has a different approach. Officials want to produce Christian education programs for its congregation. BTN officials say the idea is brand new. We are, we are in many ways pioneering for the first time. By this time next year, BTN hopes to have its satellite into orbit and its Christian education programs in full operation. But only churches that belong to the Southern Baptist Convention will be able to pick up the signal. 
However, other churches can still purchase videotaped equipment to record their own worship services. Many local church leaders browse through pamphlets and scanned taping equipment to see which systems they'd like to buy. We have been broadcast for about two and a half months, and we're interested in broadcasting and editing our own services. One thing church leaders like about Christian television shows is that, unlike television news programs, they probably won't have to worry about the ratings. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News. Church leaders scanned videotaping equipment to see which systems they'd like to purchase. The display looks similar to equipment a television news station would buy, but now many churches are copying the news media's business of recording a message, but of a different kind. Baptist Telnet is pioneering a new concept of videotaping Christian education programs. We hope to do somewhat with video as we've been able and successful in doing in publishing and the literature that goes into all of our Southern Baptist churches. But other churches, which aren't able to pick up BTN Signal, are still interested in recording worship services to play back to the congregation. That's why Fraser Memorial United Methodist representatives yes, were at the and, conference um, today. Years I found that um, many large churches have been going to TV because of the shut-ins that they have and uh, out-of-town members, and uh, it just gives an extra outlet for people to receive the services. Church officials expect those satellite dishes commonplace at homes to be an ordinary feature at churches in the future. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News. The House leadership lined up three so-called enhancements for the menu today, saying again it was imperative to consider these measures so the administration officials would know how much money to work with. A bill speeding up collections of taxes from utilities passed without any problem, but the other two bills didn't do as well. An enhancement measure which nearly doubles many court costs ran into some problems as the House leadership tried to explain that part of the new money would go into a separate fund under the control of the Chief Justice to pay for mandatory legal education courses. Representative Rick Manley called it a slush fund. On a close 44 to 42 vote, the House killed that measure. Instead, a nearly identical bill raising court costs and putting all of the new money in the general fund was passed. The third enhancer was the showstopper. It would speed up income tax collections from about 4,000 of the largest corporations in the state, bringing in nearly $67 million over the next two years. The bill brought accusations that the House leadership is anti-business, a charge that raised the hairs on floor leaders. Opponents of the bill succeeded in tacking on an amendment giving new corporations a future tax break if they operate at a loss in the first couple of years. The House leadership tried to adjourn, lost that vote, then launched a filibuster. Later, they successfully rushed another adjournment motion through and will have until Thursday to count heads and regroup. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. If we do not fund the... Either we also won the one in Saugahatchee. At the state tournament, we had three boys finish speech. We need the press also. That's why we're glad you're here today. A Canadian representative, Gordon, five or six over par with three or four holes to play and did the same thing. Those two or three. Had a good finish. Had a real good year and also good in academics. In front of him is home. The bill authorizes a three-member racing commission to oversee the racing, betting, and collection of a tax on all the bets placed. 51% of the tax money would be earmarked for the Macon County Board of Education. Representative Reed says since the bill is local in nature, he hopes other lawmakers in the area will allow it to pass and let the people of Macon County decide on the dog racing question. Uh, millions of dollars a year are spent in Montgomery and the city of Auburn, Opelika, uh, Phoenix City, and all the surrounding areas. We do not sit back and ask our people not to shop in distant cities. We encourage them to shop wherever they please. And I'm sure the impact of the trade in any one of these cities uh, would be felt if it would be withdrawn. And some Macon County officials think the voters, unlike three years ago, will approve dog racing. Anything can change in three years, and it's looking a lot more positive today. We feel quite confident that the people will support uh, a race, racing referendum in Macon County today, yes. If the legislature approves the bill, it'll be up to the governor to sign it or veto it. His aides say the governor will consider a request from some Macon County officials that he sign the bill and let the people vote. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol.
regardless of whether you're the parent or not the parent. It is kidnapping, no matter what it may be called. We are here representing our organization. To get this bill changed, we need the help of the people of Alabama in supporting us to get this bill changed and get it passed through the legislature in Montgomery today. One years have passed since today's blacks will leave Archie and to apply it to their own lives. I introduced a moment ago that on behalf of its member institution. The college and university now presents to him the Eddie Award on insurance and educational areas in the state of Alabama for many years. Who was on behalf of its member institution? Mr. Fredwell wasted no time defending the statewide asbestos removal plan. The EPA in Atlanta has told us that we have the best and the most comprehensive asbestos removal program, uh, statewide program, in the country. He lashed out criticism to those who criticized him for something Mr. Fredwell says they haven't the foggiest idea of what they're talking about. Because I'm convinced, folks, that we're just, a lot of people are talking about something that they don't even know what they're talking about. Removing asbestos is not an overnight process. A number of strict guidelines must be followed. The extent of the problem must be defined. Surveys must be conducted. And schools must submit an outline of the extent of the problem before any work can begin. Mr. Fretwell says many public schools haven't completed that phase of the project and are getting impatient. However, he says the Attorney General is getting politically motivated. Montgomery County schools are the only school system that have met all necessary requirements. Mr. Fretwell says work could begin on the worst hit systems, like in Huntsville, this summer, and in other likely affected systems by the fall. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News. You may have heard what one of them in a moment of exuberant perspective, perhaps, uh, more than others who are here. I was reminded of that because I was entitled Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. Recall our New England forebears. They came to the America's early into a freedom doesn't justify the new kind of censorship that we're witnessing in America today. In my Please, Diane, your colleagues and viewers, how much I appreciate as to the result of the new leadership that they've given us. Mr. Chairman, I say that. I have promised to do everything that I can uh, to help relieve that situation. Uh, and the governor has promised to work with the other sheriffs in the state to see if the, we can possibly transfer uh, some of the, those state inmates to some of the other county uh, facilities throughout the state with cooperation from other sheriffs, which, by the way, has been done in the past. But the situation does still remain that I uh, will not accept uh, these state inmates in the state institution simply because of the federal court order we're under and because of the bed space that we have. Twenty-five prisoners remained in the abandoned car dealership across from the Morgan County Jail today. They were placed there yesterday after Sheriff Buford Burgess became upset when even more state inmates were brought to his already overcrowded jail. They have expressed all along that, that we don't have any place to put them, and I don't doubt that. But they're their prisoners, and I don't have any place to put them anymore. But today, State Prison Commissioner Fred Smith said the state is working on the problem. I have promised to do everything that I can uh, to help relieve that situation. Uh, and the governor has promised to work with the other sheriffs in the state to see if the, we can possibly transfer uh, some of the, those state inmates to some of the other county uh, facilities through our state with cooperation from other sheriffs, which, by the way, has been done in the past. At one point last night, the sheriff was apparently ready to bring 32 prisoners to Kilby Correctional Facility on a judge's order to relieve overcrowding at the jail. That order was later rescinded. State officials say it's just as well. I uh, will not accept uh, these state inmates in the state institution simply because of the federal court order we're under and because of the bed space that we have. As for the state van and prison workers, state officials say the sheriff held them illegally for five hours yesterday. Now the state has them back and won't press charges because they say they understand the problem the sheriff faces. They're facing it themselves. Tom Foreman, WSFA-TV News.
State prison officials say they are trying to help Morgan County with the overcrowding problem, trying to find other county jails that might be able to take some of the prisoners. My need and my concern is what I asked the governor's office for was some help to guard these prisoners. I didn't ask him to remove them. This only highlights the fact that I've been uh, talking about now since January, and that is uh, the need for additional funding for the Department of Corrections so that we can uh, get the state inmates out of the counties because it is becoming, as this proved yesterday, and a completely unmanageable problem. But the state prisons are also overcrowded, and even though new facilities will open soon, it may not mean an end to the problems. Presently, uh, where the, the funding uh, of our department stands, we need a 21 additional million dollars to operate these facilities. So while state officials say they sympathize with the problem in Morgan County, if there is any attempt to move the prisoners into the state prisons, the inmates will be turned away. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. All the civilian employees at Maxwell and Gunter are evaluated each year. It's not unusual. It happens every spring. But right now, the civilian workers are being evaluated for a second time because the Air University commander, Lieutenant General Charles Cleveland, didn't like the results of the first batch of evaluations. In a memo dated April 24th, General Cleveland says the original evaluations were inflated, and he sent them back to supervisors, saying the bulk of the ratings should fall within a central range. This is a arbitrary and capricious decision on uh, the part of the general. C.E. Lanthrop presides over the local government employees union. He says the general has broken the union agreement. Uh, they may be higher, but uh, again, our contention was in negotiating our agreement was to rate the people accurately and what the person really truly deserved and not rate them down or up just to satisfy any particular predetermined uh, bell curve or rating spread. In a prepared statement today, the Air Force denies any attempt to downgrade ratings across the board. Lanthrop says he hopes to work this problem out with General Cleveland, but if he can't, the union is prepared to pursue legal action. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. Think that the lethal the injection bill was on the Senate Judiciary Committee's non-controversial agenda, really but all the public testimony was in opposition to the bill and the death penalty in general. The director of the Civil Liberties Union of Alabama, Mary Widener, characterized lethal injection as reminiscent of Nazi Germany. Kathy Anschelies of the Alabama Prison Project called the idea of lethal injection being quicker and less painful than electrocution a myth. Attorney General Charles Graddock, who's publicly opposed the switch to lethal injection, was present, but he didn't testify on this. Senator Don Harrison of Montgomery wanted state executions to be more spectacular. He wants public hanging. If we're going to carry out the death penalty, we ought to make it so bad that anybody who might even think about committing a crime that would give them the death sentence would be scared as hell, and excuse my language, scared as hell to do it. His idea was rejected, and the committee approved the lethal injection bill 7-3. to three. But this wasn't the only execution bill to be approved. Earlier in the day, Representative Jack Biddle of Gardendale moved the bill out of committee to give condemned prisoners a choice of execution methods, as long as they donated their body organs. On another matter, the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee went to work on a bill that would allow city governments to meet in secret with lawyers. A Montgomery newspaper's poll of the committee indicated that the bill didn't have a chance. But on a voice vote, the committee put off the final decision on the bill. Lots of committee action in the House today, too. Chris Grimshaw reports on that. The asbestos cleanup is already underway in Montgomery County schools. The only school system that so far has met all requirements. Asbestos samples are being collected from other schools. But Mr. Fretwell says the extent of the problem has not been defined, although the problem is serious. However, he says plans to remove the cancer-causing agent were completed long ago, even before Mr. Gretick criticized him for delaying it. Although his staff approved our plan months ago, does the Attorney General have an alternate plan to offer? And if he doesn't have an alternate plan, then perhaps he would like to suggest what steps could be left out of our plan 
and still ensure the safety of asbestos workers, teachers, and children. Mr. Freckle says Mr. Graddick is using the project for political purposes and says the Attorney General doesn't know what he's talking about. We have some people making statements about asbestos who haven't the foggiest idea what they're talking about. Mr. Fretwell says work should begin in the worst hit schools by this summer. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News. Superintendents, teachers, parents. Second, we accept the staff recommendation. Didn't further discuss. But as an annual thing, uh, I, uh, I think that even to be given the same notice and make them at a reasonable time, uh, possibly after the. Well, and Mr. Terry here for putting this thing together because suitable for reoccupancy and certify that levels of. Attorney General has criticized our plan although his staff approved our plan months ago. Does the Attorney General have an alternate plan to offer? And if he doesn't have an alternate plan, then perhaps he would like to suggest what steps could be left out of our plan and still ensure the safety of asbestos workers, teachers, and children. There were nine House committees in action today with a number of major bills up for consideration. The House Education Committee considered a bill to give job security to school support personnel like lunchroom workers and bus drivers. Backers of the bill, like Alabama Education Association's Dr. Paul Hubbard, say support people represent the only segment of state workers who don't have some protection for fair dismissals. But others, like Rick McBride, speaking for state school superintendent Dr. Wayne Teague, said the bill goes too far by setting up binding arbitration and expanding this protection to include anything from simple reprimands to outright firings. Dr. Teague was also quoted as saying the bill was nothing but a setup for teacher unionization. In other committee actions, state employees could get a break on political activity if a bill passed by the House Judiciary Committee makes it through the legislative process. The bill allows employees to take part in, contribute to, or launch their own political campaigns. Also, the House Business and Labor Committee approved two major bills. One would establish a prevailing wage law, which would force contractors working on state, county, or city-funded projects to pay predetermined salaries to their workers. The other bill sets up beer territories, which means beer wholesalers would be given exclusive sales areas. For instance, there would only be one Miller distributor in a given area, and he would have exclusive rights to all Millers sold in that area. The beer distributors say they're pretty much working in territories now, and the bill would help keep beer taxes in the individual counties. But the retailers say it would keep them from shopping around for the best wholesale prices, and it could drive beer prices up by as much as 20%. All of the bills will be in line for House floor debate Thursday. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News. When you kidnap a child, regardless of whether you're the parent or not the parent, it is kidnapping no matter what it may be called. We are here representing our organization. To get this bill changed, we need the help of the people of Alabama in supporting us to get this bill changed and get it passed through the legislature in Montgomery today. Yesterday, before you know, we received the letter, we received it this morning, we had already communicated with the Federal District Court in Mobile and indicated that we would be filing something with them on Thursday. And in fact, the court has set an evidentiary, pardon me, the court set a hearing for uh, Friday morning at 10 o'clock. The All-Pro Racing Circuit returns to Montgomery where it got its start in 1980. Saturday night at Montgomery International Speedway, a field of 34 of the best stock car drivers anywhere will compete for a purse of $33,000.
Two members of the famous Alabama gang, Donnie Allison and his nephew Davey, will be competing. Both were on hand at MIS this afternoon for an informal meeting with the local press. Donnie Allison is racing All-Pro after many years of success on the NASCAR circuit, while Davey is racing All-Pro as a hopeful stepping stone to the Grand National Tour. Both look at All-Pro from a different perspective, but both agree it's a very competitive circuit. You know, in, in the NASCAR circuit, we run mostly big race tracks. In this circuit, we run a half mile, the five-eighths, and what have you. And it really is surprising to me to see a competitive feel like we have in All-Pro. To run competitive on the All-Pro, you have to be a good driver. You, when you win a race, you know you've beat the best. Yeah, there's probably as many competitive cars in this race that uh, will be here Saturday night that I've ever seen in one place. And, you know, we've run three so far this year, and all three of them have been just alike. Uh, you can't sit back and ride. you got to go the whole time. Time trials begin at 5.45 Saturday afternoon at MIS. The last chance race runs at 7, and the All-Pro Auto Parts 200 rolls at 8.30. Rick Pons, WSFA-TV Sports at Montgomery International Speedway. That it was really very little more to them than something they might see on TV. And I'm very much the transparent, but I think in the name of the NQA, we could actually promote We could actually promote the giving of organs, and we could make the death penalty sound like because they're saying, well, look, the uh, our supervisor has rated us, evaluated us, given us our uh, ratings, and then for one man to come along and say, look, uh, I feel the inflated, just cut them down and change them. It is uh, demoralizing, uh, frustrating, uh, both to the supervisor and the employee. <laughs> University, a couple of years. Do you have evidence that you are excused from the rules of campus living? Are you now part of an elite student society? Is you to a special breed? This is your budget. And I look at it. said, that's it. Three national championships, as you probably know. And Coach Mitchell was his all graduates at all economic levels who are succeeding and who are graduates of ASU. There was a there is a 90 day uh, requirement in the regulations in Alabama's regulations now that says that DEM exists. We've got both criminal and civil sanctions now. If, uh, if a transporter has no permit and he's carrying toxic waste in Alabama, he could be fined up to $25,000 per day. And if he is a repeat offender, it will be doubled, $50,000 a day, and he could be put in the penitentiary for up to 10 years. Uh, under the old law, they had uh, DEM has a 30-day requirement. If they catch somebody breaking the law, polluting, they've got to get. I got life imprisonment, I could get out in 10, 15 years. And uh, when I got out, I know where... Uh, we were prepared for it. 
He is scheduled to be electrocuted May the 13th. All of the issues that he has raised thus far was addressed in the John Lewis Evans matter. They were identical. The only way that he can get a, a federal habeas corpus writ granted or a stay um, is to impress the court that there are possible new issues. He's going to probably stress the fact that he was not the trigger man. That issue has been addressed by the Alabama Supreme Court. <clears throat> it has been before the United States Supreme Court on three different occasions. The court has declined to give that uh, issue any merit, but there is one issue that he is going to raise, and that is that uh, electrocution in Alabama is cruel and unusual. Uh, well, from the turn of the century, uh, the law has been clear uh, from the United States Supreme Court that uh, electrocution in any state in this country is not cruel and unusual. I expect that they're going to try to say that Alabama did something uh, that was cruel and unusual. I'm going to uh, present an evidentiary hearing to Judge Hand to clearly show that uh, what Alabama did, the execution team with John Lewis Evans, uh, uh, they carried out their function professionally and effectively, and uh, the fact that the strap broke on, on the leg uh, was not anything anybody could anticipate. The commission has been talking to police, government, and community leaders, gathering information on how police relate to the black community. It's too early to uh, uh, give you any data. We haven't had enough time to sit down and analyze and to study that. Um, we will. Um, but uh, so far, so good. We're, we're quite pleased with the reception that we've received. Um, Today, the Alabama Advisory Council to the Commission was updated on the study. One area of concern for the Commission, how complaints against police are handled. There is also concern that the entry-level pay for officers may be too low to attract the best people for the jobs. But the Commission has really just begun its study and has reached no conclusions. There will be what's called a fact-finding informal hearing uh, toward the end of the summer. We discussed today in the meeting that we hope to have it by the end of the fiscal year, and the staff informed us they thought that would be uh, certainly possible, and that uh, the committee is hopeful that we will have a report before the end of the calendar year. That report will include all the Commission's findings as well as recommendations on how to make things better. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. The advisory committee today received the latest word on how the study is going. And I personally can say I'm pleased with the cooperation we're getting uh, from everybody that we're speaking with. The commission is looking into many aspects of police operations, including hiring practices, officer training and pay, and relations within the department. Uh, I think it should be pointed out that the Alabama Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, uh, the committee which has initiated this particular study, is a committee that's composed of um, Alabama citizens, uh, persons who obviously have a knowledge of what's going on in the state of Alabama in terms of civic matters and certain civil rights matters. The commission calls what it's doing a study, not an investigation, saying they're not here to cause trouble. We're here to uh, look at the question again of police community relations uh, with the idea in mind of uh, lending assistance, with the idea in mind of, um, of trying to evaluate the extent of problems and or progress, um, which obviously uh, are characterizing the situation at this point. Although the commission says it's too early for any conclusion, some say they are convinced police are trying to do a good job and want to recognize any problems that might exist. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. Well, I think we, I think we, we formed that. The court's opinion said a portion of the 1,300 items confiscated in a June 1982 raid on the African head shop owned by Flowers are not drug related. The order further states some of the items must be returned to the owner. Assistant District Attorney Frank Hawthorne has another opinion. We contend that all these items are drug related. The Code of Alabama authorizes the state of Alabama to condemn these type items. In essence, when you condemn it, we just take it by the state and destroy it. The DA's appeal was filed several days ago, and a hearing is expected soon. Efforts to reach Johnny Hartwick, Mr. Flowers' attorney, about this matter were unsuccessful. The Alabama Civil Appeals Court may not be the last step in this issue. Both sides have a right to appeal the decision by the Civil Appeals Court at the Alabama Supreme Court level.
This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News reporting. Allison shows no effects now of that brutal crash at Charlotte in May of 1981. Serious injuries kept the former NASCAR champion out of racing for six months. Since the crash, Donnie says he's never had second thoughts about climbing back into a race car, such as this 1981 Camaro, which he'll race at the All-Pro 200 this Saturday night at Montgomery International Speedway. But apparently, someone has reservations about his racing. Since the wreck, Allison has had limited Grand National experience. He's had offers, but Donnie says they aren't what he's looking for. Well, right now I have to talk to several people, and uh, I'm not going to drive another Grand National car until I can get in one that's competitive. And uh, uh, when that time comes, if it comes, I'll do it. If it doesn't, I'll run my all pro car. Are you itching to get back on the NASCAR circuit? I'd like to do it. I really missed it Sunday, you know, sitting there watching everybody out there, Neil and Bobby and everybody else. I really wanted to do it, but uh, I don't want to ride, I want to race. Until that right ride comes along, Donnie Allison will race the all-pro circuit in places like Montgomery. He admits it's a far cry from NASCAR and Talladega, but the thrill is still the same. I get just as much enjoyment out of running at Montgomery as I do at Talladega, and you know the bottom line is to win the race, and I'd be just as happy to win this race as I would Talladega. Uh, you know, people may not believe that, but that it may not mean as much uh, monetarily, but uh, as far as the feeling goes, it's still the same. Rick Pons, WSFA TV Sports. The enhancement speeds up the collection of income taxes from about 4,000 of the 39,000 registered corporations in Alabama. It doesn't increase taxes. But when the measure first surfaced Tuesday, a group of members offered an amendment to give those corporations a future tax break if they operate initially at a loss. The House leadership lacked two votes Tuesday to kill the measure, which they say will take about $160 million away from the state over the next 15 years. As debate on the amendment resurfaced today, its sponsor, Jabbo Wagner of Birmingham, knew the administration officials had been working to kill the tax break amendment. Mr. Wagner said he realized a great deal of pressure had been applied to swing votes. He asked the members to vote their convictions. Meanwhile, administration lobbyist Farrell Patrick worked his way around the House chamber, talking to possible swing votes. Outside in the rotunda, business lobbyists were comparing head counts. One and a half hours of debate later, the vote. The administration had succeeded killing the amendment on a 51 to 41 vote. Three other diluted versions of the same tax break amendment were also killed and the bill finally passed 64 to 30. Even though there are four other enhancements that have not been addressed yet, the House leadership appears ready to move on to the governor's crime package, which is expected to appear in the lineup when the House returns next week. The Senate spent most of its day considering various resolutions. The Senate also received 39 appointments by the governor, appointments that need to be confirmed by the Senate. Many of those appointments are not new, and the appointees, like Auburn Board of Trustee member Bobby Lauder, are already serving. The Senate Rules Committee plans to hold confirmation hearings next week. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, at the Capitol. The Attorney General doesn't want Alabama to be known as Dumping Ground USA. He's patching loopholes in existing laws that govern hazardous waste transport and disposal. The amendments would fine and jail truck drivers and storage sign operators if any violations occur. 
Transporters must now promptly report any hazardous waste spill to the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, and operators of storage or treatment facilities must notify ADEM immediately if any delivery is attempted without a proper permit. That's, in my judgment, <clears throat> as strong as any place in this country. Penalties for violating uh, the laws are stiff. If a transporter has no permit, and he's carrying toxic waste in Alabama, he could be fined up to $25,000 per day, and if he is a repeat offender, it will be doubled, $50,000 a day, and he could be put in the penitentiary for up to 10 years. Mr. Graddock doesn't think he'll have any trouble getting the bills passed. Kim hey, Davis, WSFA, TV News. Truck. Come to find out that... Uh, after a disappointing 2-6-1 season, the work is well underway to reconstruct the Alabama State football team. Coach George James, after his first ever losing campaign, begins rebuilding with 47 returning lettermen and 17 starters. Top priorities are building depth on both sides of the line and pepping up an anemic offense that failed to put points on the board last year. Help there must come from the quarterbacks, where there's currently a five-way battle for the starting position. It's not a competition in that position. And I, I like it that way. I wish we had an old position like that, and I wouldn't have any worries. What is it going to take for Alabama State to improve? What, what will make them a better team than 2-6-1 and one next year? I think we have got to have a, a consistent offense in line. If we get an offense in line, we can move the ball. And, and regardless of the situation and, and, and the field of position, I think we'd be all right working on our defense in line and our linebackers so we can give our secondary some help. Bama State will conclude spring practice after seven more practice sessions. They'll wind it up with the annual black and gold game May 14th. The site of that game is yet to be determined. With Alabama State spring football, this is Rick Pons, WSFA TV Sports. We have, we have located. Police officials say they don't suspect foul play in Davis's disappearance. In fact, they don't have much to go on, except that he hasn't been heard from, and that's highly unusual. We looked all night last night for any clues. Then this morning we called a state helicopter in. We searched the upper part of Tallapoosa County, and Coosie County, and part of Elmore County for the truck, but we didn't come up with nothing. The last time he was seen, Davis was driving a truck like this one from Skinner Furniture Company in Alex City. He was making deliveries in Elmore, Tallapoosa, and Coosa counties, but officials can find no one who saw or talked with Davis yesterday afternoon. He was wearing tan slacks, a blue plaid shirt, and cowboy boots. If you have any information on James Davis, you can call the Coosa or Tallapoosa Sheriff's Office or Alex City Police Department. Gina Gregory, WSFA-TV News in Alex City. Law officials say there's no sign of Davis or his truck, like this one. He made deliveries in a three-county area for the furniture company, but no one has seen or heard from Davis since yesterday morning. And law officials say that's unusual for him and why they began searching for him last night. Last night he didn't show up, and uh, people was waiting on him, and he's always showing up on time from his route. So the fact that he just didn't come home and he was in a truck, that caused you all to go ahead and start searching? Yes, ma'am. Sheriff Smith says right now foul play is not suspected in Davis's disappearance, but they really don't have anything to go on. He says if his truck is found, it should provide some clues. Gina Gregory, WSFA-TV News in Alex City. dollars a day and he could be put in the penitentiary for up to 10 years. If a transporter has no permit and he's carrying toxic waste in Alabama, he could be fined up to $25,000 per day and if he is a repeat offender, it will be doubled, $50,000 a day and he could be put in the penitentiary for up to 10 years. These people all received an invitation to dinner from Jack Smith. However, none of them knows who Jack Smith is. There was one requirement for the guests. Each person had to invite another person of the opposite race. I really have no idea who he is, and I've you know, asked face to face several people that I thought might have done this, and I really don't know, and I think it's a wonderful idea, and I think that 
that we're all Jack Smiths tonight. Mr. Smith sent a letter to be read during the meal. It said he was worried about race relations in Montgomery and that part of the problem had to be that blacks and whites don't really know each other. Many times people fear each other uh, simply because they don't know each other. And uh, to sit down and talk uh, is always very good. I think we have a, a good example to look to back to back to Jesus, you know, 2,000 years ago. Um, he thought it was good enough to, to sit a group of uh, 12 different people down together. And Mr. Smith wrote that his immediate reason for bringing these people together was the so-called Taylor family incident, the recent brawl between a black family and two white police officers. I do feel very strongly that the, the political climate in this city uh, is such that doesn't, it does not lend itself to any mending any harmony. Uh, this community needs to pull together and start talking about some of the problems that we have and doing more things like we're doing here tonight. So I think the, the gentleman hit on a very good note, uh, whoever he is. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. The Astros scored first in the first. Off race starter Craig McMurtry. Dickie Thawne lost this long sacrifice fly to center. Omar Moreno will tag from third and score one nothing Houston. But the lead didn't last long. Bottom of the first, Mr. Long Ball. Dale Murphy greets Bob Nepper with his two-run home run over the left field fence. It goes. Murph's eighth of the young season, 2-1 Atlanta after one. Houston tied it with one in the second, but Atlanta took the lead for good in the fourth. The game winner comes here as Bob Horner rips a double into the right field corner. Murphy scores easily from second. Braves lead it 3-2. Atlanta took a 4-2 lead into the eighth when the Astros made it interesting. Gene Garber on in relief and Phil Gardner singles between third and short. Omar Moreno scores from second to cut the Braves lead to 4-3. Then Atlanta adds insurance in the bottom of the eighth. Glenn Hubbard rips this two-out, two-run homer to left center. It's the Hubs' third of the year and the Braves pad that lead to 6-3. Steve Bedrosian picks up a save for McMurtry, getting Moreno to ground out here, ending the ball game. The final from Atlanta, Braves 6, Astros 3. Rick Ponds, WSFA TV Sports. At the present time, we are reviewing this legislation and coordinating with the EPA in Atlanta and in Washington to see that we do uh, maintain the compatibility that we have to with them. Now, we can be much more stringent, or let's say some more stringent than the EPA but we can't be more lenient or in conflict with the EPA, so we have to uh, get their blessings on this legislation before we can come out with full support of it or get it uh, in an area where we can support it. One thing was the, during uh, previous years, the program, we have 681 houses in the government inventory. Now this represents an investment by the taxpayers of the United States and the taxpayers of Alabama with a little over $18 million sitting out there. Now while all this is going on, we're getting uh, pressures from, from all kinds of sources to include yesterday to increase lending uh, to building new houses. Mark, fellas, you can figure out what the percentage is, 25 million, excuse me, we'll spend a little over $25 million in that program this year. And in this 502 program, the one that... An April 1st report shows that although inspections are required once every three years, they're overdue in at least 36% of the x-ray facilities in the state. 
Aubrey Godwin, Alabama's radiological health chief, says some patients and x-ray operators could be exposed to dangerous levels of radiation from machines overdue for inspection. Godwin says money and manpower will solve the problem. $100,000 will last to hire three people, at least three people. These people will do inspection work, both in x-ray and radioactive materials, and within two years, we'd probably be caught up, because it takes a while to train them, of course. And the rest of the money would be to buy the equipment to be used for inspection work. One way to raise the money, Godwin says, is an inspection fee system. He added the maximum would be $50 per x-ray tube and $30 per dental x-ray tube. The cost to consumers would be a penny or less per x-ray, according to Godwin. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. But most of the matters that, uh, that we from time to time have problems over are, are budget matters or how we perceive uh, the way things ought to be done. He's entitled to his viewpoint and I'm entitled to mine, I guess. And uh, it's uh, the American way, I guess, to uh, try to be, try your best to, to get your point of view to prevail. I certainly have no animosity to Joe Reed personally. I think he's uh, a pretty sharp guy. And uh, But we do have our differences about how the city ought to be run, and I don't minimize those differences. Okay, next question from uh, Norman Lumpkin, special assignment. Mayor Falmer says race relations in Montgomery are not the some burning problem that some that people they, think they, they are. I don't think it's that bad. I see people all the time and uh, they don't have uh, a hatred for the other race that uh, is supposedly represented by some of the council members. I don't see it. Catch As the for the problem. frequent arguments between the mayor and some city councilmen, the mayor says that has more to do with politics like than that. race. But most of the matters that, uh, that we from time to time have problems over or, or budget matters or how we perceive uh, the way things ought to be done. He Councilman Joe Reed, who has often clashed with the mayor, disagrees. Well, first of all, one has to recognize that in Montgomery, Montgomery has been a city with the politics of race. I think, unfortunately, uh, the city is racially divided. I think we all ought to work overtime to try to be sure we restore uh, some uh, sanity back to this problem. This is election year. Sixty-six days from now is election day. So everybody is posturing for that purpose more than anything else, in my judgment. If there are racial tensions in the city, the mayor says they come more from perceived problems than real problems, but nevertheless should be addressed. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. If there's a question and you brought it up, about uh, the, the health of the governor, which has now been called into question by every, uh, everybody in the media now, that, that people go and camp out by his hospital, your people included, are there camping out in the lobby waiting to see. So if it's an issue, uh, it surely ha should have been an issue, it seems to me, uh, as we were preparing to select our leader. You've made it an issue now. Why didn't you make it one then? And my mama went running in the bedroom, and it started from the bed. They started, we've got water trying to put the fire out, but the fire was getting too far gone, and it started blazing up all of a sudden. She told everybody to come out the bedroom. Well, I think we're pleased. We've always said that there were serious constitutional claims about Ritter's case, and the court's going to hear them. I mean, there's no guarantee the court will rule in our favor, and all we can ask for is that the court give them serious consideration, which the court's going to do. 
Well, obvious reaction would be one of disappointment. I, we recognize that uh, when Judge Hand set this case today that the number of witnesses would give rise to uh, Ritter's attorney's plea that they didn't have time to discover and, and, and take depositions. And of course, we had the witnesses here available and ready, but uh, I can't be mad at the judge. I, I think uh, uh, they thought long and hard about it, and we'll just have to go back to work.